Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to another episode of Spitting Venom, aka The Venom Vlog. Today is episode 94. I'm here at the comic store. I went by House of Secrets to pick up some comic books, which I'll show you here in a second. But first, I want to give another shout out to Golden Apple Comics. Uh, big thank you guys for letting me record in your shop. That was really awesome. And to hang out with Joe was really great. So if you guys haven't watched episode 91, where we talk about Venom the Mace from the Separation Anxiety trade paperback, please do. Because on today's episode, we're going to talk about the Knights of Vengeance, which is the next storyline that pops up in that graphic novel. So after the we have Knights of Vengeance and we're gonna get into that very shortly uh, but I do want to give another shout out to House of Secrets and for the books that I was able to pick up here today uh, I got spider Gwen number 29 I think this is the conclusion or maybe the issue before the conclusion of Gwenum and uh, I flipped through it a little bit it looks like it has some cool battle scenes and a cool reveal uh, at the end so I won't give that away but we will give this digital code out uh, probably in a, in a very soon episode very soon uh, probably either the next one or the one after uh, so yeah keep it out for that. I also have uh, the Doctor Strange Damnation tie-in. We have Scarlet Spider joining the new Midnight Suns with Ghost Rider and, and uh, Iron Fist and stuff. So I'm, I wanted to pick this up. I really like the first issue and now it's crossing over into the actual Doctor Strange book and Scarlet Spider and a couple other titles. I think there's going to be a Ghost Rider one-shot. So yeah, I'm, I'm hooked on for this event and we will do a whole video series on this event. We'll probably do like, we'll wait for like three or four issues to come out and then we'll do like a whole video on those three or four issues and I'll give out digital codes at that time. Uh, uh, for Venom stuff, we also picked up Poison X number four and X-Men Blue. Uh, so this, I'll, I didn't flip through this one yet. I didn't want any spoilers. So I'll read this. But for now, you guys, here's the code right there. First person to put that code in gets the comic book, as always. Uh, and if you miss out on these codes, don't worry. I, you know, Every once in a while, I give out these codes for you guys. So you'll have plenty more chances to win stuff. So there you go. Put that code in. Go to that website. Put the code in. And you'll get a free digital copy of X-Men Blue issue 22 which is Poison X Part 4, I believe. Uh, so only two issues left in this storyline, and then Venomized starts in April, and I'm very excited for that. And the last thing I picked up is Thanos, number 16. My roommate got me hooked on this title. I picked up the first two trades by Jeff Lemire. They were pretty good, but once Donny Cates took over, I was really digging the storyline. And my uh, roommate, like I said, owns a piece of original artwork, and he has it up on the wall. So uh, that, it just, every, every day I stare at that when I cook in the kitchen, and it's just so awesome. So it makes me want to collect the series now. So I've added this to, uh, not not my pull list, this is something I can pick up at House of Secrets every week uh, since I already have a, a pull list over at Golden Apple. So this is cool. I can come by here and pick this up. And this is like, I guess some of the backstory of the Cosmic Ghost Rider. And if you don't know who that is, I'm not going to spoil it for you here. But this will be a digital code we'll give away at some point as well. So yeah, thank you guys for that. And again, Golden Apple, thank you for having me there. While I was there, Humberto Ramos showed up, one of the artists of Spider-Man and the Champions, current Champions book at Marvel, but also drew Venom uh, in Venom the Hunger or Spider-Man Venom the Hunger. Uh, that was a great book. I have the images up on screen here and my picture with Humberto uh, was really awesome to meet him. I've met him a few times before, but to see him right after filming a Venom episode was super, super cool. Uh, I love that. And that's the greatest thing about going to House of Secrets and Golden Apple is you never know who you're going to you know run into. I Last time I was in House Secrets. I think Bruce Tim was in here uh, talking to another customer about Black Panther the movie and what they liked and stuff about it and stuff. So I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Like you never know who you're going to run to at either of these stores. So if you're in the LA area, definitely pop by both of them. They're excellent spots for uh, for you to nerd out in. Uh, and then yeah, other than that, that's all I got for this intro. You guys, if you want, we're going to talk about uh, Knights of Vengeance now. So buckle up because we got a lot to talk about. All right, now that we got the intro out of the way, let's talk about Knights of Vengeance. So this was a four-issue miniseries that came out in the mid-90s, mid to late 90s, and uh, and it was uh, really cool because it actually tied in a little bit to the Ghost Rider lore. So obviously we talked about Spirits of Venom and that stuff recently. That had happened as early as, you know, right after Carnage's first appearance. So now Ghost Rider is in his main book nearing like issue 50 and so. And for a short time after a big event called Siege of Darkness, uh, and keep in mind Howard Mackie was the writer of Ghost Rider throughout the, the whole series in the 90s. He also was the writer of this book called Knights of Vengeance. And in a storyline called Siege of Darkness, the Ghost Rider seemingly died. So for about four or five issues, this character named Vengeance, Michael Badalini, uh, Badalino, uh, Badalino, Michael Badalino became uh, the new spirit of Vengeance in a way. He was a character called Vengeance. He was originally created as a villain and fought Ghost Rider, but over time they found common ground and became allies. So Vengeance decided to take up the mantle of Ghost Rider, and he was Ghost Rider for about, I think, three or four issues from uh, episode or issue 47 to issue 50 of Ghost Rider. Uh, so we did have Ghost Rider missing in action for about four months or so. 
And then Ghost Rider made his big return in issue 50. So then Vengeance was kind of like went back to the back seat. And I think Howard Mackey had a lot of uh, admiration for this character. And I think it was a character he helped create, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, and he wanted to do more with him. So when he got um, on to writing Venom, the Knights of Vengeance miniseries, he was like, let's bring Vengeance over. We already seen Venom team up with you know, Ghost Rider, and that didn't really go too well, and they didn't really seem to have like a mutual respect for each other. Let's bring over someone like Vengeance, someone who's a little bit more on edge at times and who has the size of like Venom. He's like a bigger kind of Ghost Rider guy. And uh, let's tell a story with this character. And I thought he did a good job. Actually, Knights of Vengeance, I remember liking a lot as a kid, but I liked a lot of Howard Mackey's writing when I was younger. So rereading as an adult, I was like, okay, is it still gonna hold up? And I, I was impressed. It still does in my opinion. Uh, certainly, you know, this book is featured or this story is featured in the Separation Anxiety trade paperback. And we talked about with Joe at Golden Apple, how the first, you know, uh, story, The Mace was not a very good story and how the book gets better and better. Well, this is proof of it. To me, Knights of Vengeance is leaps and bounds above what happened in the Mace. And this one ties a little bit more into what's happening with Venom. That was the big thing missing from the Mace was that it felt like it felt like Carl Potts was kind of trying to put a bow on this other story with the Shadow Masters and try to tie up those things and didn't really tie it too too much into Venom and what was going on with that character. In this one, it's the exact opposite. You kind of get mostly a Venom story with these other characters brought in, like uh, Vengeance and the Stalkers. You get kind of you know, those characters brought in, but it's not like super heavily focused on them, although they all get their own moments, they all get their time to shine, and they all get their backstories, which is really cool. So in this story, it starts off and there's a, a homeless guy named Sean Knight, and he's on the run from these guys trying to kill him. Uh, and he rounds a corner and you find out the person chasing him is Michael Badalino, who is Vengeance. Uh, and he's coming around the corner on his motorcycle looking for, uh, for Sean Knight, pulls him over, grabs him, puts him up against the wall, and then almost out of character in my mind, threatens to shoot him in the leg. And he says, look, if you don't give me the information I need, I'm going to shoot you in the leg. And when you find out later that he didn't really intend to hurt Sean at all, you're kind of like, then why did he say that? Even though maybe it was an intimidation thing, try to get information out of him. But still, like, I, I you know, uh, Michael Badalini or Badalino, he knew enough to, like, be honest with people. Uh, so I was kind of a little shocked by that one line. But nitpicking aside, uh, the the you know, reaction from that is that he has a homeless guy against the wall, Nally, in San Francisco, and that just does not fly with Venom. So Venom intervenes, uh, beats up uh, Badalini pretty good, or Badalino. I keep calling him Badalini, but I'm sorry, it's an old habit. Uh, I never pronounced his name right growing up, so I'm trying to get better at it now. Uh, but he, he grabs Michael and he knocks him out. He slams his head against his own motorcycle and knocks him out. And so, uh, so now Venom, you know, takes him and Sean Knight back to his homeless friends down underground. And down there we run into Beck and then also Elizabeth, who, uh, you know, the art is drawn by Ron Lim. So I'm kind of wondering if Ron Lim was like, hey, the character of Elizabeth that we kind of introduced in Lethal Protector, she was never touched upon again. Is there any way we can bring her back? And I think Howard Mackey did a great job tying that character in because she was kind of the one who first met Eddie Brock in Lethal Protector. I believe it was the same character. And, uh, and she kind of has feelings for Eddie in that story and then Beck was introduced after that and then as Beck you know became more of a thing in the miniseries she became the love interest so in this story what they tackle is uh, is two women who kind of like Eddie but you know Beck she does not like the Venom costume it scares the, the living crap out of her every time in every miniseries that her and Venom are having a conversation she yells at him and goes Eddie take them like make the face go away I want to talk to Eddie Brock not the symbiote the symbiote scares me she does it every single miniseries and it's no different here she's yelling at him like take if you're gonna to talk to me about this homeless guy and this like you know random dude that was gonna kill him like if you're gonna to talk to me about them do it as Eddie Brock. So he's like, all right, I'm sorry, Beck, I'll become Eddie Brock again. And also you have Elizabeth there who has feelings for Eddie. So it's kind of like this little love triangle thing that is starting to uh, kind of blossom. And they kind of add that as a backdrop. But there is actually a payoff for it. It's set up and it's not focused on too much in the story, which I like. They kind of just get to the action and the storyline, the main story. But this does kind of wrap up a few things with Venom. And it has Venom and Eddie Brock actually make a rational decision. And I think that was huge uh, for the character. And I think that's, uh, you know, attributed to the team that was on this book, Ron Lim and, and, and Howard Mackey, probably discussing what they want from this character. And they want him to probably be more of a good guy and more of a, a hero than an anti-hero and try, at least try to give more shades of good and rationality than just the craziness we've seen him uh, act lately. 
uh, especially in like the Mace and other stories. So this was a really good move forward, I think, for the Eddie Brock character because in this he makes a lot of rational decisions. So when Badalino wakes up, when Michael wakes up, he confesses, look, I'm actually a, you know, a, a government agent and I've been looking for Sean Knight. He is too a government agent. He's not a homeless guy. He's undercover and he has a story to tell us. So why don't we ask this, what the story is? So uh, he's like, I'm trying to get information out of him. So Sean Knight wakes up, the homeless guy, he wakes up and he says, all right, here's my story. I was working for the government and I was infiltrating a group called the Stalkers. And the Stalkers are these four like mercenaries for hire, like uh, soldiers of fortune that are going around the world and doing some horrible things. And uh, they were on American soil and I was, you know, tasked to go, uh, you know, join with them and work undercover uh, and, and get into their unit. So after, you know, a year or so of working undercover, I infiltrated their unit. I became friends with them. But the, the leader, Trent, always suspected something was off of me. And so when we got pinned down by another government agent, right before I was about to expose them, we got uh, trapped by another government agent that was hunting them. And it led us into this cave. And when we are in there, we found an alien spaceship. And next to the alien spaceship were these weapons. And there was a voice in my head saying, pick up the weapons, pick up the weapons. And all the others must have heard the same voice because they went over and grabbed the weapons. Trent, Cass, um, Briggs, and Raiden are all the four characters on the team. And uh, they go over, pick up the weapons, and the weapons are actually alien technology, and it's like a nanotechnology, and it wraps around them, almost kind of like Warlock uh, from the New Mutants and stuff. I, I kind of equated the look to them of like that, where they have like they look like they have computer chips and stuff all over them, and so they get taken over by this alien race. They're still half human and now half alien. Uh, and then at that point, Trent, as the leader, has all this access to information and knowledge, and he realizes that, uh, that you know, Sean Knight is a traitor. He's in trying to infiltrate the group. So they try to kill him, but he's, like, on the run, and then that's, he runs out from the woods into the city. You know, coincidentally, he was out near San Francisco. He gets into the city, and he's been on the run for a few days, why, which is why he looks homeless and smells bad, and, you know, and he's been, you know, trying to stay alive and outrun these, these creatures that are after him. And that's when he runs into Badalino at the beginning of the book. So he tells this great story about how he got involved in all this. So again, big setup, big backstory. And then the stalkers show up and they come and in invade the underground city where Venom is. And Badalino wakes up and everyone's ready to do battle. And then for the first time we see Badalino turn into the vengeance. So up until then, you know, people who don't know, who haven't read Ghost Rider, they don't know who this guy is. They're like, oh, he's just a, like a, a buff government agent guy. We don't know who he is. Uh, but then when Venom is in trouble, when the stalkers start beating him, Badalino is like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step up now. And he turns into Vengeance, and he goes right for the stalkers and starts tearing them apart. So Venom and Vengeance team up. They beat up the stalkers. The stalkers, you know, power down. They're seemingly dead. But then the alien technology fully takes over, and they wake up again, now resurrected, fully machine in machine mode now, where the half-human side is now gone, and they're not like cyborgs or androids anymore, they're full-on like machine technology. And they look at Venom and Vengeance, and they say, we're gonna go recharge, repower up, uh, but now the human sides of us are mostly dead, we've taken over, and we are called hunters, and we are from somewhere far out in the universe, we're the last of a dying breed, and our goal is to just expand and spread our, our, you know, our technology. So we are going to do that by taking over the human race, and we're going to hunt all of you down. And that's pretty much the, the rest of the, the three issues after this, because this all happens in issue one. And so, yeah, it's a lot of packed, a lot of story packed in. And so Venom and Vengeance are now being hunted. So it's like predators almost. So these four beings are hunting Venom and Vengeance. And they're like teleporting them to different parts of the globe and chasing them like in South Africa and South America. And they're like teleporting them all over the world and hunting them. And one by one, Venom and Vengeance are killing all of them. And meanwhile, Beck and Elizabeth and some of the homeless people and Sean Knight, they've all been captured. They're under the um, control of the alien race. And the alien race is starting to like infiltrate them and try to you know assemble them into their technology so now there's a, a ticking clock which is a lot of times what you want in a story like this where it's a lot of action you want a reason for the heroes to finish the the job quickly and it's to save the humans the homeless people that have been captured uh, by the aliens and so venom vengeance they team up uh, it's kind of an unlikely friendship at first as you can imagine would be but then they instantly start respecting each other even moments where vengeance says hey look clearly you have two women that love you what are you going to do about it? And this is the rational decision Eddie makes. He says, I'm not going to choose either of them. Like, I'm not going to choose one or the other. Like, I know you're telling me to because, you know, feelings are involved and stuff. And I, I guess Badalino is trying to get more in touch with his feelings, uh, being the vengeance and all. So uh, 
Eddie Brock says, I'm, I'm not going to choose either. But if I am with either woman, I'm going to ruin their life. I am an alien creature from uh, outer space, and I'm a human who has a bad past. And I've done a lot of bad things. And I'm just going to attract more and more danger, like stalkers and like the, this group that's hunting us, the stalkers slash hunters. Like, it's just going to keep getting worse and worse. It's going to escalate, and I can't uh, you know, afford to have either of these women be hurt because of me. So I was like, holy cow, Like that was a big, uh, to me, a big moment for the character to kind of stop pining over uh, Beck for sure, uh, because I didn't really like that relationship and how like Eddie would just fawn over her. Um, so yeah, it was just, it was, it was a nice step away from it, that and Eddie again, like I said, making a choice, because uh, he doesn't do that a lot in some of these miniseries. He doesn't make a choice that advances him as a character, and I thought this was a big choice he made. So in the end, after all the stalkers are destroyed, they merge into one. Trent is the last one living, and he absorbs the technology from the others, and now he's the, literally the last of his race. He's fighting Venom, and uh, Venom stabs him through the stomach with a, one of the energy spears, and uh, and the and the symbiote you know is fighting off the infection. It's like trying to infect Eddie, and the symbiote's pushing it away. Uh, and so this so then the alien talks to Eddie, and it says like, look. If you press that button and explode me, you're going to lose all contact with your the rest of your race. You know, like, I know Planet Symbiotes had happened and all these other things had happened in the storyline and in the comics, but I've been out in the universe and my race has been out there. And even though I'm one of the last of my races, uh, last of the hunters, I've seen other symbiotes. I've seen what you guys have done. I've seen those other symbiotes that are like you, uh, that aren't just bloodthirsty creatures. Like, I can show you them. Like, come with me. We'll go to the universe together. We'll get away from this crappy planet and just come with me and we'll go and, and find more people like you, more, you know, symbiotes like you. And, and then Eddie's thinking about it. He's like seriously contemplating it. So is the symbiote. But then the human that's still in Trent comes out and begs, like, look, it's weak. Like, you know, press the button, kill us both. Like, it's going to take over and it's lying to you. It's not going to give you what you want. Like, just kill us both. So then Eddie presses the button and destroys the alien, losing any possibility of him connecting to a different side and different, you know, parts of his race that are out there in the universe, the symbiote, the Clintar race. And, uh, and I thought that was another big moment, another choice Eddie had to make that, uh, brought real sacrifice to the character. So when the book ends, even though him and, and Vengeance got along and they, they you know, became friends essentially, uh, they, I, I kind of liked it. I liked the, the relationship between those two. And I hope Vengeance comes back in the comics at some point, and I really hope he pops up in a Venom comic, because I like this relationship. I thought it was really strong, and it was done really well by Howard Mackey, and I like that Venom made the choice between the two girls and decided, all right, I'm going to walk away from the homeless people for a while. I'm going to walk away from this stuff. I'm going to head back to New York, and I'm also going to dig, use some of my, you know, journalistic skills as Eddie Brock and try to dig and learn more about the other symbiotes. And there are still five symbiotes out there that are spawned from me, Scream and Phage and Lasher and all those others. He's like, I want to find them too, uh, because they kind of came from me. So I do want to connect with my race in some way and try to turn those who have turned evil. I want to try to turn them. So now I have a mission and I want to get to it. And we will talk about that mission in the next couple episodes when we talk about the Exile Returns, when Venom goes to New York and he encounters the Scarlet Spider, and then Separation Anxiety. Both of these stories are also included in the Separation Anxiety trade paperback along with Knights of Vengeance here. So please pick this up, because even though the Mace wasn't a very strong story, Knights of Vengeance, Exile Returns, and Separation Anxiety all just get better and better and better. And I can't wait to read Separation Anxiety because it's been years since I've read that. But first we gotta do Exile Returns and we gotta see how Eddie Brock gets separated from his symbiote. And that's what separation anxiety is all about, is him trying to reconnect with it, but also learn more about the Clintar race, more about Scream, Phage, and all these other characters. So there's a lot of cool stuff coming up on the show, so I hope you guys stay subscribed and stay tuned for that. And thank you. Let me know what you think of Knights of Vengeance down below. Did you read the comic? If you do, do you have a favorite moment? If you didn't, is there anything you you know that I covered that you have questions about? Let me know down below and I'll answer them. Thanks so much for watching my show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and I'll see you in the future. Peace.